just want to shout out my channel members. So thank you to Josh Cameron, Blunt to Heavy, Isaiah Robeson, Tristan Hoffman, Jaeger Bomb Legend, Noble Bulls, James Isn't Real, Andrew Peacock, Andreas Anderson, and Micah Carter. Thank you for your continued support. So, today I just wanted to talk about a few movies that I've seen recently. Um, most of these are fairly recent films. These aren't anything that's um, necessarily in theaters. Um, but while I was sick and spending a lot of time lying in bed unable to do anything else, I was able to catch up on my movie backlog and check some things off my list that I've been meaning to watch for a little while. So I just wanted to talk about them a little bit here today. As usual with all my movie reviews, these are not spoiler-free reviews. Um, I'm going to be talking about plot points, things like that. Uh, just kind of stream of consciousness. The first movie I want to talk about is Perfect Days. I think this came out last year. This is a movie that had a huge positive reaction to it. And um, I, after watching it, I can see why. For me personally, this is a five star movie, five out of five. Uh, and I just love the vibe and the atmosphere of this movie. So this is directed by Wim Wenders. And it's the first movie that he's done since 2017. And his first notable movie since probably the 90s, since, you know, the 2000s has kind of been full of uh, unremarkable films for Wim Wenders. But I think this movie, because uh, I know, I think the Japanese government, um, played a part in getting this made. I think this movie was kind of a, a tool to promote tourism or to just to promote like a, a sort of Japanese way of life a little bit. And it is a very effective um, propaganda piece if you want to be uh, dramatic about it. Your main character is Hiriyama, played by Koji Yakujo, and the film just follows him in his day-to-day -day life, uh, cleaning Japanese public toilets, and they go to some of the iconic, if you can say iconic, uh, public toilets around the Tokyo area that are kind of famous, like the one with the translucent glass, and you know, just sort of the ones that are uh, picturesque in a way. Uh, but it's, you know, you're following him his day-to-day -day life. He, he goes, he wakes up in the morning. He goes to work. He cleans the toilets. He has his lunch in the park near the shrine. He has this this film camera and he takes pictures of, of trees and nature and things like that. He goes to this restaurant after work, watches baseball, has uh, the same meal, the same drink, right? So it's kind of just this, like I said, this whole movie is just about vibes and atmosphere. And what I like about this movie is that different people can interpret the movie different ways. And I don't necessarily think either interpretation is wrong. Um, 
Some people interpret it to be a very sad story about a guy who lives a very monotonous, dull life. Um, you know, he doesn't have a lot of money. You know, he's just sort of going through the doldrums of day-to-day -day life. And then some people find a sort of um, uh, a pleasant simplicity in that you know, he's, he's yes, he is um, poor and he's cleaning toilets, but he isn't like you know, an extremely stressed out salary man he isn't, you know, dealing with some of these other negatives of modern society and like I said, I think that the way this movie can be interpreted either way is very cool because uh, you, 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 take, you take away from this movie uh, whatever you want to um, and I love the contrast between Hirayama and Takashi. See, Takashi was kind of like his apprentice or a younger employee. And you see, Takashi is very wrapped up in the trappings of modern society. There's this girl he really likes. But he's like, oh, I need to get a lot more money to impress her. I need to be doing this. I need to be doing so much more. Uh, you know, do more, do more, do more, kind of the rat race aspect. Whereas Hirayama is just completely separated from that. And then we see that even more uh, later in the movie, Nico, his niece, comes. And he's spending time with his niece, and you see, like, he's really enjoying spending time with her. Um, then her mother, uh, his sister comes and gets her and she's driving a fancy car, she's dressed nice. Uh, so you're kind of seeing that contrast between their ways of life and things like that. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a very beautiful, atmospheric uh, movie. I really enjoyed it. I found it quite moving. Uh, I thought it was very poignant. I, 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 took, I got a positive message out of the film. Another uh, foreign film, but this time by way of South Korea. This one's a little bit older. I think this came out in 2016 or 2017. And that is The Wailing. Now, I had heard really good things about this movie. A lot of people saying it's like one of the best uh, horror films of the, the 2010s onward. I uh, mean, personally, I'm a big fan of the horror genre, but a lot of modern horror films I just don't really like. You know, I don't like the jump scares. I don't like, you know, I don't like the Conjuring movies, Annabelle, things like that. It doesn't really do anything for me. But this movie, The Wailing, this is a very good uh, Korean horror film. Extremely atmospheric, very haunting. Personally, I give this four stars out of five. Personally, I give this four stars out of five. Um, there are certain parts that I felt maybe dragged a little bit. There are certain things that, you know, I thought the movie could have been a little bit shorter. But overall, I really did enjoy this movie. You're following a uh, police officer, Jong Gu, who's not a very good cop, kind of like a dumpy guy overall. The characterization of him is a little weird, like he's not a good husband, he's not a good father, he's not a good cop. But he's sort of your protagonist here, he has a daughter, Hyojin, uh, who ends up being getting possessed by the end of the film. Um, little thing is like this Japanese man comes to the village and like if you know anything about the history of South Korea and Japan and like the tension, the racism, the all the baggage that comes with that and people start getting sick and possessed so like there's an aspect of it where you're like oh 
is this like a metaphor for racism and like these people are all assuming it's him but actually it's not but it actually does end up being him at the end uh, and there's like this thing with this with this priest uh, or monk uh, I think it's a I'm pretty sure it's a Buddhist monk um, the, I know there's different uh, types of Buddhism but then like he's doing this ritual to try to save the daughter but I'm like well is he actually helping her or is he hurting her and then I guess there's a deleted scene where it finds out that the priest or the monk is like helping the Japanese guy do all these bad things um, but like like me explaining it, it's not gonna sound great. It's just one of those things that like you have to watch it, and then you're like, okay, when you watch it, it it'll make sense. But me sitting here like explaining it, it's gonna sound weird. Um, but that entire scene with the ritual, and you have the the monk like doing his chanting and singing and like breaking things and thing, and meanwhile the daughter is like screaming and. That whole sequence is just very, like, anxiety, high anxiety. And at the very end, um, so there's a, I think he's Catholic, a priest who's a friend of Shanggu. And at the end of the movie, like, he tracks the, the Japanese man into a cave, and he's, like, confronting him. He has a rosary and stuff. And then the Japanese guy, like, reveals his true form and he transforms he has like red eyes and black skin and he has stigmata on his hands so I think they're alluding to him being Satan they don't outright say it but um very good uh, extremely haunting horror film it's a movie that'll stick with you you're gonna wanna like you're gonna watch it and then you're gonna be thinking about it um my little rambling about it here didn't really do it justice. But the wailing, I would definitely check out. Another movie I'd recommend, another horror movie, and that is The First Omen. If you saw my video a couple months back, I was talking about upcoming movies I'm excited about. This was one of them. And I finally was able to watch it uh, two days ago lived up to the hype for me. Uh, this is a 4 out of 5 star movie for me as well. This is of course a prequel to The Omen, a movie from 1976. So going into this movie, I was kind of like, okay, how are they going to contend with the fact that we know where this is going? Um, you know, they can't change what happens in the 3 or 4 movies that come after this. Uh, but honestly, in my opinion, that kind of worked for the movie. I think the dread of knowing where it was going to end up, and you're kind of slow burning and building towards that ending that you know is coming, made it uh, better. That worked in this movie's favor. I don't think every movie built a pulsing like that off this director. I think this is a first time director that did this movie. She did a great job with this. Uh, you guys know I love religious horror films in general. Um, and you have a great cast here. You have Ralph Innocent as Father Brennan, who's kind of the guy that discovers this conspiracy to birth the Antichrist. And then Sister Margaret, who um, is sort of his inside woman. She's getting the information for him. But then the twist at the end, and honestly, I, I kind of was 50-50 on whether I thought it was going to end up this way. She ends up having the mark of the beast, and like she's been embroiled in this whole thing from the beginning, unbeknownst to her and everybody else. So you have, you have Carlita, and then Margaret. They both have the mark of the beast. And the whole scene where they reveal that Margaret is the second one that lived. Uh, that was done fantastically. And the end of the movie where her baby is being born and ends up having twins, Damien. And then the 
other child because I think the uh, the daughter, the female, the sister of Damien, I think that's from The Exorcist 4 because Damien is killed in 3, but I think they still want to do one more movie, so they did one with a, a female uh, Antichrist, and so I think that's how they worked this in, but uh, yeah, this the first omen lived up to um, all my expectations, the, the, the way they played on the horror elements. They show you just enough to be scary, but it wasn't like a, a gore fest or anything like that. They were very subtle with what they did show. They, they could, you know, it would have been easy for them to kind of overdo it here and uh, give you everything you want and more, but they were restrained, which I think works in the favor of this movie. Um, and just made it all the scarier. I think this movie is like out on Netflix now already, uh, at least here in Australia. But if you if you haven't seen the first Omen yet, I definitely, definitely recommend it. Now the final movie I want to talk about is Blackberry, uh, about the rise and fall of the phone company Blackberry, and as someone who was a former Blackberry user. I, uh, I was very interested in this, because of course, I'm a huge fan of Always Sunny, and seeing Glenn Howard in it in a different type of role. Um, this has been on my list for a while, and for me, this movie is a 5 out of 5. The driving forces of this film is Jay Barshell. He plays Mike. Then Glenn Howard in as Jim. In my opinion, of the two, Glenn Howard inputs in a bit of a better performance. He's a more of a commanding presence. And in the latter third or so of this movie, he has a lot less screen time than he does in the uh, first two thirds. In my opinion, the movie suffers a little bit for that. Um, but what I like about this, you know, there's been a lot of movies like this recently, these biopics about companies, um, they just did one like on Nike and them signing Michael Jordan, and I did not like that movie, I think it's called Air, so comparing this to that, you know, this, I hate using this word, but this movie feels very visceral and grounded, like it feels like you're in the moment with the characters, the way they use the camera work, um, it all just felt very, like, in your face. It felt like you were in the scene, and they, they accomplished that really well. Um, really great directing in this, and great um, production design to achieve that. And what I loved about, like, you're seeing the way these characters change, mainly uh, Mike. He starts off very mean. Uh, not really able to stand up to Jim. Very focused on the product and his integrity. And then you see as the years go by, he becomes a little bit more of that corporate CEO type. In the end, he ends up stabbing Jim in the back to save his own skin, showing how much he's changed. However, he's also sold out his principles. The whole movie is like, no, we're not going to outsource. We're going to do it in-house. We're going to do it properly. At the end of the movie, because they're facing the pressure from Apple launching the iPhone, he sells out his principles. They ship their production to China, and there goes the downfall of Blackberry. So, you know, I loved that, that character development scene, basically this, who you uh, sympathize with as a good guy, a principled man, um, seeing his downfall, and because of him compromising his morals, the failure of his company as well. And I love this movie, it shows the speed of advancement, how fast circumstances can change, you know, one day Blackberry is, they're the big fish, they are the the uh, defining product in their market, and the next day they're dead in the water. Um, also, I loved the frequent NHL references in this, which I didn't realize that was a real thing. Um, the guy Glenn Howard was 
string bought the, or was attempting to buy the Pittsburgh Penguins, and I believe later, the Nashville Predators, and he wanted to move them to, um, Hamilton, I believe, Ontario. And he has a scene in this where he just, like, blows up at Gary Bettman and the owners, and the, the, the casting for Gary Bettman was really good. For a second, I thought it was actually him, but... I believe this was uh, a production of the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and they did a this did a really good job. I loved this movie. It's yeah, kind of a short video, but just four movies I watched recently and really enjoyed: Perfect Days, The Wailing, The First Omen, and Blackberry. If you've been looking for something to watch, something to add on to your ever-growing. Uh, watch list. I would recommend any of these four films. If you've seen any of these or you end up watching any of these because of this video, let me know what you think. I'd really be interested in hearing other people's opinions about these. If you like the video, please leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this almost every single day. Until next time, guys.